Hey, welcome back to the CCW Safe Podcast. I'm Mike Darter in Oklahoma City. Stan Campbell standing by his side until the end. Oklahoma What's City. going on, Stan? What's the latest? The latest is, um, well, you know what? Things are starting to loosen up here in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, several states across the nation. Uh, still be mindful of your distancing and stuff like that. But, you know, um, what I like, really like about the distancing, you know, I talked about this before, but is the fact that it really makes you aware now of people versus keeping your head down. You're, you're really being aware of people now, and mm -hmm. as concealed carries, you always got to do that. So I'm, that's one good thing that's going to come out of this. People will pay attention to others. Yeah, I think for, for a time. Um, I don't like the word social distancing. What do you like, Michael? What you I, don't, I like physical distancing. I like the word physical distancing, but the word social distancing has a very, I don't know, almost like an evil context to me it really does i mean it's just i i just don't like the word social that's because distancing. you're a social butterfly you are my starter the party starter I'm, and, and i understand that yeah so you're the sun and i am the sky that's why i got all this on this physical color. distancing yeah i think it's true i i, I i've yet to believe i've yet to determine you know how we are here and really people everywhere how quick they forget mm -hmm. about things you know i mean at, at, happens all the time I, I think that um you know we'll get back to a back to a normal at some point <clears throat> but um but it is good to you know i think uh situational awareness probably has picked up you know yeah. a little bit with people which is good yep but uh anything else going on what's what's mama no, mona you know mama mona she's still hanging at the house yeah. you know she hasn't she's not going too far she's got a couple of stores she'll make it to uh, it was Mother's Day, so my daughter did take her oh, to yeah. a restaurant because they nice. they eased up enough for her just to. <clears throat> and it was like yeah, wide open. There's not that many people. Well, we went we went the other day to have brunch Sunday, and yeah. it was packed. It was. Packed. I was surprised. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't like super surprised, but I thought you know most places are easing back in like twenty five percent, or it was it was pretty. Packed. That was about ninety percent. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I mean we still. I mean it's still good. You just got to be aware of people. The um, the folks working there are still wearing masks and gloves, which is I'm fine with that. I don't want to yeah. mess with my food and coughs and crap anyway. <laughs> <laughs> just keep your little germs to yourself <laughs> beyond this virus. But I'm good with that. I mean it wasn't bad. We had a good time. Yeah, yeah. I think things are. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens in, in the upcoming months. I I can't wait to get. Start to travel again. I'm really missing New York City, man. I'm missing I mean, New York too, man. We, you, know, you know, we we got a lot of new friends in New York, but New York is awesome. Oh man, New York is just there's no city like it. And yeah, but uh, you're going somewhere different coming up, aren't you? Where are you going next? I don't know. Um, you know, I was supposed to go to. I was looking at Patagonia mm -hmm. uh, this summer to go lead. Tell the tour. people where that is. Patagonia. Uh -huh. It's like Argentina, Chilean border. Nice. Down, um, but Patagonia is, you know, amazing landscapes. The mountains are, like, straight up. Um, I've always wanted to go to Patagonia. And I had an opportunity to go this summer to lead a tour, a small tour, kind of a scout trip mm -hmm. to um, Patagonia for Pumas. And in June, July, that's their winter. So it's going to be it's pretty harsh winters, but it's really good, great landscape uh, opportunities for photography, but also for the Pumas, so, but I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. <clears throat> so. If you don't do that, you're going to head down and take some pictures of some sharks, right? Yeah, I'd like Maybe. to go back to Cabo. I'm yeah. um, just talking about taking my daughters to Cabo. Um, be awesome. But, yeah, like I said, we'll have to see what opens up. Yes, sir. So. Well, speaking of opening up, we're going to open up the show with our, our, our guest today is uh, Sean Vincent. Uh, one of our content providers, and, I mean, he just really, just a, a wealth of knowledge. I, I love what he does for our members in reference to the articles and stuff that he writes, the podcast that he does with Don West. Um, you know, you I, I think uh, really what we, over the years, because we've, we've had a great relationship with Sean, um, it really when we first met Don, mm -hmm. when we got Don. And I think I always still say that the the – Articles that they're working on are really the meat and potatoes of what we, of what we can offer. Absolutely, what, we, the, what we've put on our website, and this is not just for members. This is for anybody. So anybody who 
thinks, uh, you know, is even thinking about having a firearm should really be reading these articles before you even get a firearm. And if you have a firearm, especially if you carry, you really need to be reading these articles because these articles, like I said, they're meat and potatoes of, of our whole thing. We talk about people mitigating their own risks, mm -hmm. Sean, and this is the best stuff to, uh, you know, really, to, we, we talk about a lot about, um, we talk a lot about <clears throat> um, mental imagery, mm -hmm. visualization and stuff. These articles are the best source for these scenario situational type things to think about because they actually happened. That's right. <clears throat> and we actually have an outcome. So, Sean, thanks for doing this. You've been doing this for, what, three, four years with us now, maybe even longer than that. It's been a while. <clears throat> yeah. I'm in COVID land, so I can't remember time anymore. <laughs> yeah, time. But I, got, I got a lot of – no, what's interesting is, you know, years ago, before I joined you guys, you know, I was involved in a number of high-profile self-defense cases from the, the fender's side, from the defense mm -hmm. team's side. And then we had an opportunity to start uh, commenting on – other high profile self defense cases. And I thought back then, you know, I'm going to keep track of these because sometimes they take a couple of years to go through the system, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes what comes out in court is way different from what you thought happened from just the news up front. You know, I'm going to watch these and look for themes in those. Mm -hmm. And so I had kept track of about nine cases that I was watching over the years. And then that's when Don started working with you guys. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he came to me with the opportunity. Uh, I think he told you guys about me. And he said, I don't know what you think about this, but here's Cease to Be Safe. Here's what they do. And here's what they're looking for. And I thought, um, you know, I think that would be a great idea. Because if we do our job right and we show real life scenarios where most of these people, these defenders that we write about mm -hmm. who make some mistakes in their self-defense, they're inherently good people. Yeah. They're law abiding people. These aren't, these aren't criminals out there. These aren't murderers looking to go kill someone. They, they, they're people who made some tactical mistakes, maybe made some emotional mistakes mm -hmm. and it breaks my heart that somebody died. Yes. And it also breaks my heart that somebody who's a good person is now labeled a murderer and mm -hmm. their lives are destroyed. Their families are turned upside down. So I told Don, I said, if we can, illustrate these lessons and save you know somebody's life yes maybe who didn't deserve to have it saved but save it anyway and then preserve somebody's liberty mm -hmm. and and their future then it'll be worthwhile and i think you know i think we're on our way so absolutely and and before we get too deep into that because we do want to break that down uh if you would sean um you know i mean there's some things that we don't know about you uh sure. tell us yeah. about uh you know your, your journey you know, into becoming, you know, the amazing writer that you are today. <laughs> ah. Yeah, uh, well that, that's, uh, you know, it's funny uh, is in college, I decided to be an English major. Okay. And I was working full time. It took me like 11, 12 years to get through my four year degree. And I remember, <laughs> I remember I graduated with an associate's degree. And I read at the time in Florida back in the 90s, that like the average starting salary for someone with an associate's degree was $26,000. Uh huh. But then if you go back to school for two more years, Stan, and get an English degree, yes. it goes down. <laughs> <laughs> so inspired by that, I, I pursued my heart. <laughs> and while I was you know, in wholesale distribution during the day, I got a, an English degree at night. So I'm fascinated by stories, <laughs> storytelling, and what you can learn. You know, I'm kind of a book nerd every once in a while. Yes. And uh, so, yeah, I like to write. And then... I was in communications and marketing for years, had my own little business, <laughs> kind of followed the internet as that was coming up and got into helping people communicate with social media when that became a thing. And then um, the whole recession happened. My business got turned upside down and by a strange series of coincidences, I, I, a friend of mine in Rotary got a real high profile self-defense case. I call it the famous case. It was yeah. on all the TV shows. Yes. And uh, I was involved with that. I never considered law as anything I was remotely <clears throat> interested in, but I, I felt passionately about our case. I was fascinated by um, the court system, but even more so, I was fascinated by how much misinformation there was out about that case and 
what really is true and what do we know and what don't we know and and stand something you said uh, earlier i heard you say that you know who tells the best story sometimes wins and that really focused me on the power of yeah i wanted to be the one who would tell that best story correct and so that's what got me interested in in telling stories especially from this legal point of view so there you go storytelling and how i got into to legal stuff there in one shot so out of that case i was invited you know i had the opportunity to do some commentary mm -hmm on other cases like the michael dunn case and then got hired by an indigent indigent defense organization to help them handle high profile cases and you know i do jury selection stuff so training up a team to help do social media research when you have a, a murder case that's awesome so then then there you go now i do a lot of plaintiffs work i work for a lot of you know folks who have been the family's lost somebody killed in a terrible accident or catastrophically injured and and that's storytelling too so i'm all i'm all up in the legal industry now fake lawyer i'm a fake lawyer <laughs> like bull that's right <laughs> and then you know you know um in the way that we use you for the maddox case uh, have you ever done anything like that before during jury selection oh sure i have a i have a whole team of folks we do that very frequently where we get um yeah, you know, we get a panel. Mm -hmm. it, like they call it voir dire. Yes. Yeah, you know, jury selection process, yes. and we know who's on that panel. And so I have a team. You can never do it just by yourself. It's too much work, too fast, mm -hmm. right? Yes. We have a team. We go online. And we find out everything that we can uh, that's publicly available mm -hmm. about those prospective jurors, and then the lawyers can use that to help inform their impressions. And you know, one some of the times where that's most valuable is mm -hmm. what do you know mm -hmm. that the yeah, other that side doesn't, doesn't know? know yeah. That's right. Right? And we knew that the foreman in that jury was somebody who was real Second Amendment, you know, was thoughtful about self-defense. Mm -hmm. So we didn't ask him any questions about self-defense. We already knew what we wanted to know. And anything right. he was going to tell us, the other side wouldn't like. And they didn't mm -hmm. think to ask, so we had a, a real advantage there. You know, and, you know what's interesting? Sorry, Mike. Uh, yeah, what's good. interesting, um, what's, like, when I went through my federal lawsuit on the, from the police department on the use of force, trumped up cases, of course. Mm, well, but, I wouldn't uh, expect Excessive use of force, yeah. for me, you know, um, I had to sit through that process as well. And we sat there and, you know, I, I, you know, had as the defendant in this case, you know, had the opportunity with, with my lawyers to help pick and choose the jury. And I swear to you, I mean, our first jury, if we didn't have that mistrial, I, I would not have had such a, a success, the mistrial, of course, because of a big boom called the bombing of Oklahoma City. But, mm. um, you know, but the second jurors, you know, set of jurors were a little bit more friendly in reference to um, police and, and such. Because there's a lot of people that just hated the police and we still had to have them on. <clears throat> yeah. So it's kind of crazy when you get into that situation where uh, it's not only important to be to tell the best story. But you also have to set up the play, the players, you know, in this particular case, the jur jurors, you have to set up what will, will be most likely in your favor. And what's really important about that in our context, right, is because is we all feel pretty much the same about the Second Amendment, the right to carry, right, right to bear arms. We can be in our bubble. We forget that not everybody feels that way. Mm -hmm. We forget that it's controversial for a lot of folks. And you don't get to, just like you had some folks who didn't like the police who got on your panel, mm -hmm. right? You don't you don't pick who you want for the jury. You deselect the ones that you Absolutely. most can't live with. <laughs> Absolutely. And you're stuck with the rest. Yes. And, so, and so in Florida, we pick a lot of six uh, juror panels. The rest of the country, mostly 12 folks, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know that some of those people are going to feel very differently about guns and self-defense than you do. Mm -hmm. And you got to remember as a concealed carrier that, you know, they always say it's better to be judged by 12 than carried by six. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but think about who those 12, you're going to get the crazy cat lady <laughs> from down the street with the Elizabeth <laughs> Warren sign. She's going to be on that jury. Maybe yeah, that's if right. you can't get her off and, yeah. and you, you're going to have, your behavior has to be justified to, to everybody, you know, and, and that process is during Vordar, correct? That's right. That depending on where you're from, Vordar or Vordir, if you're from the south. <laughs> and is that is there are there any other 
Uh, any other times do you work with the defense panel uh, on that, or is it specifically done? Yeah, sure. Or... Well, you know, so I, I do a lot of theme and theory stuff, mm -hmm. right? So it's, in the end, we have to, now we you pick your audience, who you're going to be telling your story to, and then now what's the story that we're going to tell? You know, so there's a there's a theme and a theory to every case, mm -hmm. and I, I legally I kind of explain it like this: like, you know, the the theory of spaghetti dinner is pasta plus hot water plus sauce equals spaghetti, right? Mm -hmm. But I found this great old photograph of uh, uh, Kurt Douglas and Sophia Loren, black and white, eating pasta together. Mm -hmm. Right, and they got a Chianti with the, in the fiasco, and and she's all buxom. And there's these movie stars, right, eating this pasta, getting drunk together, and it's all fabulous. That's a whole different spaghetti dinner than one with like a little two year old throwing <laughs> noodles all over, it, right? So you can have the same theory of a case, but the theme, the story that you tell, can be radically different. So yeah, so I work I work to help develop what's that story that we're going to tell, and yeah, we we've done uh, mock jury panels. Mm -hmm. Where to your point, Stan. You, you'll make the same presentation to, uh, say, 24 people, split them up into two groups and let them deliberate mm -hmm. individually. And you can have one group of 12, saw the same thing as the other group, come to radically different conclusions. Well, and that's just the, that's just the way of the world. You know, I, I was actually talking with somebody recently about what's going on now with COVID-19. Mm. And you have, you can, <clears throat> the news that is being delivered you can have, you know, two groups of people and they see it totally different ways. I mean, you look yeah. at masks, for example, you know, there's, yep. there's two totally different thought processes on that. And, and if you get in somebody's face about either wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, <clears throat> you are inviting a yeah. heated argument. Oh yeah. I mean, I've, I've shot seen that. Already. Oh yeah. There, it, and that's, it's, it's coming to that, and it's not. And this, the second thing that w the main thing we were talking about when we were talking about this was that it was not based on fact. Nothing is based on facts. It's based on personal opinions and ideology. And um, <clears throat> for for I, I think for a group of people, for part of the people, it is based on facts. Mm. But then. For another group of the people, and we actually referenced um, the um, the um, Brown case, Michael Brown case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> you know, yeah. even when the facts came out, if people didn't like those facts, they disregarded those facts and then went back to their personal opinion. So well, it's interesting, it's, Mikey. So in, in a legal venue, mm -hmm. right, there's a thing called you can have facts in dispute. Yeah. Right, you bring in a piece of evidence. The evidence is a fact, but do you believe that? And yeah. you're gonna have two pieces of two facts that contradict each other. And in our personal lives, we encounter that all the time. Right. right? So in a court of law, we're gonna ask a jury. The judge will tell them at the end. You know, judge everyone's testimony. You can believe some things. You can disbelieve other things. You decide what credibility to assign to it, and then you decide. And Stan, we were talking before about how, you know. You can't know unless you were there. Yes. Right? But none of us were there. Correct. And I, this is, this is, if you want to get nerdy for a minute, philosophical, I, I, like, I have this concept that I call the unknowable truth. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, and, and was it really, what was in that person's heart when they pulled the trigger in a self defense case? Was right. it malice or was it fear? And that makes all the difference, right? Yes. But we can't ever know yeah. that. And if you think about your life, what can you really know? You know, yeah. is there a God? Does your wife love you? Is coffee good for you or bad for you? You know, <laughs> like you, we just, we don't know these things. So what we have to do in order to survive uh -huh. as people, we have to, we have to come up with a way to determine uh, how much do we care? And if we, if we're forced to care and have to make a decision upon it, how do we base that decision? And I find that people will use like, first of all, what matches my life experience? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yeah. what does, you know, who are the big influences in your life and what do they think? Like, yeah. what does my dad think? Yeah. What does my wife think? What does my pastor think? Right. Yeah. What, you know, what squares with my religious philosophy or my, I, I doubt, or my political identification. Right. Yes. So we, we, we run it through, I call it authentication, all these different processes until I think we get about 70% sure. Mm -hmm. 
and then we'll and just say, okay, I'm going to believe this thing. Yeah. yeah. And then once you've once you've gone through that process, you've done that work. It takes a whole lot for you to think, you know what? I better go back and check my foundations. Yeah. Was mm-hmm. I wrong about my dad? Am I yeah. wrong about God? Am I wrong about uh, my politics? And that people don't want to have that. You know, and, and, and a lot of that too, Sean, is that a, a lot of people, you know, they just absolutely don't want to accept defeat at all. And I'm talking about, mm-hmm. you know, your position, your beliefs, all of that stuff. We all in this room and you, we can just go the way I think is really the best way, you know, mm-hmm. the, what he thinks and Justin and my son over there is bull crap. What I think is, is the right way. And then the, on the flip side of that, all of us are also trained through entertaining media. And I'm talking about like movies and such and t- television shows. Yeah. Um, they teach us and they, they manipulate us and they train us to accept an entertaining lie versus the truth. Because you can have one person do a documentary on the same incident, another person do a different perspective on the same incident. And in the way that they shoot it, it's like they, they shoot these things to move you emotionally. And that's really what happens with all of these cases as well. Why The reason why on both sides we'll see the picture of the kid, regardless of color, you know, with a Bible in his hand or, you know, graduating kindergarten, but he was he was 21 during the time of the incident. That's right. You know, or, you know, you know, the, the folks going, you know, you know, escorting their mom, you know, instead of wearing some questionable uh, social groups garb that come out in, in the future. You know, so you just never know. But we really want it's all about being tribal. You know, mm-hmm. like if, if it's a police case, a lot of times me and Mike could be right on, you know. You know, in most cases, but then right. it could be one where the offender is, um, you know, a white man or offender is a black man or whatever the case may be. And then we have to start ch- choosing, okay, well, what really makes sense? Like you said, attach, well, which yourself, one you to identify the, with? attach yourself to the 70%, mm-hmm. you know, get to the 70 because, you know, we're both going to have ways of looking at things. And we're both, you know, have empathy and compassion for our fellow yeah. man, but we don't have a problem killing somebody too. And usually he's wrong. <laughs> you see what I mean? Well, you know, and that that what's funny is well, you talk about that. There are certain times where where we have to make the choice, and there's real consequences. You know, and and mm-hmm. when you pull the trigger in self defense, mm-hmm. that's you're all or nothing. You're all in now, right? And my dog's barking. You might hear that. No, that's, that's part of my that's part of my security. You got my home security <laughs> bolstered up. Hey, dog. I didn't want a, I didn't want a dog, but my wife convinced me when it was done security get a dog. The best, right, I've Michael? always I've always said the best security system is a dog. Yeah. Whether it be even just a dog that's not like a trained attack dog, but just a dog barking, a dog, a live dog. I mean it's great security. Hound system. dog with a deep bellow. But, or or, or, yeah, or an ugly yeah. wife, that'll help. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> we were talking about we were talking about with the baseball bat. You might be you might be seventy percent sure, but you have to make a decision that's all or nothing. That's that's self defense. Absolutely, you know, mm-hmm. with a deadly firearm. Hey, Justin, did you want to jump in as well? No, I was just going to uh, mention that one of the things uh, talking about your seventy percent deal, and I I agree with you a thousand percent that once somebody takes a stance on an issue or an opinion, it's especially it seems like now with social media. Because there's echo chambers created where people feed, you know, people generally associate with people that agree with them on a lot of things. So they reinforce each other. And now the guy's like, well, everybody I know thinks this way, so I know I'm right. Exactly. Yeah. But they self-select for their peer group. Yeah. So to me, that's interesting. That's kind of mm. like a, a thousand percent on the 70 percent. That's kind of <laughs> like the 60 <laughs> percent of the time it works every time yep, uh-huh. kind exactly. of thing. Yeah, yeah. Man, I'll take the thousand percent. I would. Yeah, I'll take the thousand percent. They, yeah, they're just spot on, though. I mean, that's right. You, whoever you associate with, and you, um, you know, you, that's the belief system. It's really weird. We're getting into this discussion that is going not, not probably where we're going to go today, but it's so important. I think for where we're at right now in society, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because all everybody's decisions, uh, like I said, I mean, it's just there's already been. Physical confrontation, shootings, and um, just really um, unreasonable things happen just because of masks. Yeah. Well, and you know, one of the things, and some of the things I've been writing about now is when people from two different 
mindsets mm-hmm. come together. And it might be that somebody's scared late at night and someone's drunk and disoriented, right? Mm-hmm. But it could also be like, I think you're putting my life in danger for not wearing a mask. And mm-hmm. you're like, well, this is all a bunch of overblown nonsense and, and you're freaking out for nothing and mind your own business, right? And then you put those two together and if you can't get the folks together on it, and you don't talk about it or you don't think about what you have in common, then Mm -hmm. things can escalate real fast, Mm -hmm. you know? And so, so many of the, of the self-defense cases we see are people who misunderstand each other. Mm -hmm. And, and honestly, I mean, a lot of people that I disagree with sort of virulently uh, are also super fun people that I like to hang out with. Now I'll drink some, I'll brew some Brown with them anytime. Right, Mm -hmm. Stan? That's right. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, it's, uh, so I think as the concealed carrier, I think you have a responsibility that you inherit to be the more understanding one, mm-hmm. right? You 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 can be right and you can be wrong, but like how important is it to be right? Yeah. And and yeah. how open are your mind? Is your mind going to be? Because you're the one that has the power of life or death holstered at your side. Yeah. And and so you have to you have to be better for for both parties no you're right and it's a huge responsibility and you know it's it's, it's kind of aligned with how we were in the police department mm-hmm. you know uh, one of the things that they said in training is that there's always a gun brought to the you know to, to, the, to the fight or to the incident and mm-hmm. you know and you're the one that has it therefore you have to be more responsible and and the weight of the accountability is heavy on your side because you have the tool of death and destruction you know strapped to you so you have to make decisions as if you don't have that on you and you can't take a life. You know, therefore, would I actually put myself in this position? Would I make this move? Should I pull back and let the person win the, the, um, the verbal confrontation? You know, because most of the time, like we talked about earlier, people just want to win. <laughs> you know, if you just say, mm-hmm. you know, right. if, if you allow somebody to think that they're winning, who is really the winner? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's really you. Because you don't put yourself in a bad situation, you don't build this thing and escalate it to a point where you have to actually unnecessarily take a life. And and you know from all the cases we looked at, no matter how the jury decides, everybody's a loser. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. You that's know, right. even when these things go through, even if you're right, like even if you're even if you're ten years out, that's the choice I'd make. I'd have to make that choice again. Mm-hmm. But you still regret that situation ever happening. You know. Everyone's lives turned upside down, so there is no winner. There's just various levels of losing. Correct. You know, like, like um, you know, when we had a chance to individually have talks with Stephen Maddox, and you know, he's okay with us talking about this, but you know, even you know, years later, he'll still second guess his thoughts. You know, about you know, was it worth changing my life? Was it worth losing my job, losing my family, and having to fight for all this stuff back? You know, uh, credibility, you know, the fact that, you know, we were forced to, you know, do a, a um, you know, apply a legal team for an expungement of, of the charge and try to, re- try to clean up as much as we can on a, uh, a Google search for him. I mean, that matters when you're looking for a job. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, you think <clears throat> about that and it's like, wow, you know, what should I have done? And that kind of pulls us back into the original topic, which is, learning from the mistakes of others and get, gain as much knowledge as, as we can. And that's why we hire you to give that information to um, our audience. So let, let's kind of jump right into what, how do you and De- Don decide to come up with, okay, what are the elements that are consistent with all these cases across the board? And these are the ones that we're going to write about. And this is how we're going to separate it. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, a lot of the, cases if you want to go out there and look for you know a home defender kills a criminal and wasn't charged there's lots of those out there right Mm -hmm. and and there's lots of cases where where it's pretty clear when when a firearm was involved and and everything's cut and dried and and those don't those are fun to read and they they kind of support how we feel about self-defense and they they justify with the investment that we've made but uh, what we're concerned about is, you know, what if you're wrong about a couple of things? What if you misperceive something? What if they you thought they were armed but they're not armed? And where are the people? Where are the cases where we got somebody who we feel was 
generally a, a law-abiding citizen with good intentions who took someone's life, maybe had legitimate fear, but made mistakes that made them fight for their, you know, you call mm -hmm. that the second fight, right? Mm -hmm. Fight for their freedom. And so when we see those, they tend to be very controversial cases, um, but they have the best le lessons. So that's what we're looking for. You talked about the, the elements. Um, the things that we see, there's there certain things that exist no matter what in every case. And that is one is where a shooting happens mm. is very important legally and tactically, right? So if you're in your home, you have a castle doctrine and a certain set of standards that might change a little bit if you're just outside your home, you know, or on the curtilage of your property. That changes if, if now you're out on the street. Mm -hmm. It matters if you're in front of someone else's house or your house, right? It matters if you're in a bar or a public place or, or, or someplace you're not legally allowed to be. All that, you know, in your car, we have a lot of road rage instances. The dynamics change. So, so every shooting happens somewhere. We often like to take a look at that location and see what can we pull out of there. Mm -hmm. uh, two is um, almost never do you have a case that just goes zero to 100% in mm. a split second. There's some escalation that happens, right? There's an event that initiates the the conflict mm -hmm. right and then there's a, a at least a couple of decisions before the decision to pull the trigger that lead up to this inevitable encounter and so we'd like to look at what things did the did both parties do to either escalate or try to de-escalate the confrontation before the shooting happens right mm -hmm. from a legal standard super important is the idea of reasonable fear mm -hmm. right and so you're the, the almost every self-defense statute that I can have ever encountered says that use of deadly force is justified only if you have a reasonable fear of imminent great bodily harm or death. Mm -hmm. Imminent means right now, but then reasonable fear, that's so subjective, mm -hmm. right? And so what are the elements that constitute reasonable fear and, and, and what is reasonable, what's not reasonable? That exists, and, and often we'll put that in the perspective of a continuum, because I think I think it's really natural if someone's broken into your house for you to be afraid, but also to be angry at the same time, right? And so we've seen cases where it strayed past fear to revenge. You know, up in Oklahoma City, the Jerome Ursling case, mm -hmm. he shot that first kid the first time. It was it was justified. He was mm -hmm. holding up the place as an armed robbery. Mm -hmm. But then after that kid's incapacitated, and he he leaves, comes back, gets another gun to shoot him again to mm -hmm. kill him. Right. That's that's a clear cross the line. So anyway, right. so reasonable fear is the, the third element. And then finally, uh, we like to talk about post incident actions. And I think that's some of the most, you know, practical conversation we can have because if you're involved in the shooting, you're you need, if you can, to be the one to report it or have someone call and report it. That's right. Yeah. You know, it, it, if the other person <laughs> if one of their friends or if they survived it and they called 911 first you're on the backside of this conversation all of a sudden, right? Yes. But then you don't want to you don't want to say too much to the law enforcement cuz you guys know from use of force incidents, you're not in your right mind for mm -hmm. a day or two. Yeah. Right? You make even Maddox who encourages us to talk about his case. He he got things wrong like about how many kids he had, and where he lived. That's right. That's right? right. He, didn't, he wasn't trying to lie. <clears throat> no. He was just so shaken up. Yes. And 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 Don West, he'll tell you as a criminal defense attorney that the hardest facts to overcome in the case are the misstatements that uh, the defender stated to the police. Mm -hmm. And so what you do immediately following a self-defense shooting will have huge ramifications on how that shooting scene and, and what your legal defense is going to look like. I've had a conversation with Don, and this is something I, I, I see over and over again in your articles and other things that I pay attention to. And that is that going, speaking to what you're talking about, having to overcome initial early statements later on down the line in trial. You know, mm -hmm. a guy says something or, you know, or it's taken the wrong way or, you know, like Stephen Maddox during his initial interrogation, what was it? He didn't remember how old his kids were or something like he, that. He didn't remember how, how many he had. Yeah, how many kids he had. I mean, or where they, yeah, went to school. Yeah, all, went to all the school, the, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, stuff like that that gets said when you're under duress, 
you know, there's a reason why most police departments after a critical incident, two, three days, yeah. sleep cycles yeah. before they make a statement. Yeah. You know, it's hey, you know what's inter interesting about what you're <clears throat> saying, too, Justin, you know, coming from the way we thought as policemen, there's also a difference between your first line responder, meaning the initial officer, mm -hmm. and the investigator. Investigators, most of them, not all of them either, you know, they, they, they not only have their experience and they have different um, um schooling that they might go to in reference to techniques and such and how people react and respond about human nature that regular cops, especially younger ones, just don't know. Mm -hmm. So if you make a misstep in reference to what you say to me, then I've already, you know, you know, branded you as a liar and mm -hmm. anything you say after that is going to be held against you in my court of my head. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like mm -hmm. whatever you say, I mean, anything you say that's in favor of your defense, I might omit that, and that happens often. Oh, it happens, yeah. We've seen it happen in cases uh, personally where people get so locked into one thing that they either <clears throat> omit other facts or they find some reason, like like uh, Sean and and – Justin, we're both talking about earlier that they might find something just to admit that because it's not what they <clears throat> they may be aligned with, you know, some other thought process. And I think, especially when you hit it on the head, when talking about investigators, especially in larger cities, mm -hmm. have a lot more training. That's right. <clears throat> yeah. Than, you know, smaller municipalities. So you get into the size of the department, the budget of the department, you know, how m how much training is available. Yeah, because like in, uh, you know, our other partner, Kyle Sweet, in his department <coughs> in Enid, the patrol officer also does the investigations all the way up. Now, that could be good, that could be bad, right? And if they don't have enough funds right. to actually – you know, have, you know, learn and go to schools and know how mm -hmm. to do that, then it's just on the job training, which is not always good, especially if you just suck as an investigator. And you'll or run if into you got those. a bad trainer. You, <laughs> you know, can have that we've too. All, we've all had you some bad You can have that too. too. You're right about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, you know, and it's, I think a lot of folks feel like they're justified and that if they can explain themselves to the cops, that they're going to be all right. You know, and so they, they get a little overboard explaining things and they confabulate and they, they fill in a couple of details mm -hmm. or they get something wrong because they just didn't perceive it properly. Yes. They're emotionally distressed. They don't realize it yet. Uh, and then just, just start causing real trouble. So you know, Don West always talks about, you know, be cooperative, mm -hmm. point them to mm -hmm. evidence that you think is important. Yes. Right. But you guys, for cops, you know, if someone says, listen, I understand the gravity of what happened here and I'm shooken up. And I, I really just want – I think it's best I'm going to get someone to represent me, and we'll talk when the time's right. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I'll cooperate with you now. And one thing I like to stress is I feel like if you've shot somebody and they're dead, you've committed a homicide, whether or not it's justified, right? That's right. It's serious. If I, I, I've resolved that if that happens to me, I'm resolved that I'm going to jail that night. Mm -hmm. Right? Like don't try to talk yourself out of going to jail tonight. Yeah. At the risk of going to prison for the rest of your life. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So you'd be like, listen, you know, if you're gonna take me in, like, cause they might try to pressure you. Yeah. Like, hey, if you just help us clear up a few things, we can get you out of here, right? Yeah. No, 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 officer. I understand. Uh, I understand what's the gravity of this. I know how to, you know. Oh, absolutely. And and, and you're and, right. And and that mm -hmm. too is kind of a police trick. Mm -hmm. You know, we we want to. I mean, and I say trick. Like, excuse me. I gotta be careful what I say because we we absolutely love policemen, but. It does help you to gather the information needed, right? <clears throat> right. So you're going to try to, you know, make it so that, you know, because we used to do it sometimes with, now you do with women. Now you know you want to be home with your kids, right? You know, it's one of those. So you plant the seed of you might be going away from your children. We're going to take your kids away or something like that. That's going to help them to talk. Kind of tricky, but it, but it gets done what you need. But in most sure, cases. You can, you can flat out lie. Oh, it, absolutely. Oh, we, have a, we have a video we saw it. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and, oh, you do? Okay, well, then you know this. Or, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny about that. Um, you know, prior to us having a lot of technology around here, because uh, we had just got our computers in the cars. Uh, they call them the MDTs, right? Yeah. So we just got yeah. our MDTs in the car. Well, we weren't even familiar with them. But because no one else was familiar with them, I used to do this thing where I would put some um, – some, um, 
um, kind of guy. I don't know if fingerprint. We want to talk no, this is fine. This. <laughs> no, this is just to gather information. Just to gather information, right? Because you know, you, you can play with certain buttons and it'll make the the thing ding or whatever. So I would I would put some stuff on and I put their hand against the and I told I said, Have you seen this new technology? I said, Boy, it tells me every time who, who a person is. And I put their hand against the screen and I make it do something and I have something set to say, you know, you know, the person's not not being truthful. So it's almost like a lie detector test I created. But uh, but it worked for me. I'm like, there's nothing wrong with this. <laughs> I've never put anybody in jail for it. I'm okay. And I've been gone for over seven years. Shut up. Yeah, I don't even think you can get that uh, that charge thrown out. Of yeah, no, you really that. can't. But, no, you know, but the thing fine. about it, why I'm saying that, you know, you know, officers will come up with different things, you know, to, like, get you to say certain things or to give you the entire story. And most patrolmen, they just want to go home. They don't really care about you. They want to mm-hmm. know that this is just another call for them. They want to know what's the fact so I can give it to the investigator and then close out my little supplemental. But the problem is everything that you say in that first um, interaction with, with law enforcement gets locked in. And then when you really realize what the true story was and what you saw, your lawyer is telling the story, right? And, yeah, and, and, and that was the problem down. because it looks like you lied in the beginning. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so as hard as it is. Uh, you just gotta shut up, be cooperative, but you know you gotta get you gotta get Gary on his way. That's what you gotta do. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that d- nowadays, like when we were uh, on the street, it was a lot different than it is now. <clears throat> I think nowadays, most police officers understand this as well because of all the, um, you know, police shootings have increased been high right. yeah, yeah. And, and i think that that police officers are even like well i'm not going to talk to him until i talk with the fop rep or mm-hmm. the pba rep or whatever so i think you know you can you can tell you know responding officers hey man i, I want to cooperate with you i want to do everything i can to help you do your job I, I don't i don't really feel comfortable right now i'm shooken up and i and they're they're going to understand that yeah, more I think then when we because as we you know when we were officers I mean we understood we 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 got some training on physio, uh, the physiological effects and stuff mm-hmm. like that but not as they do now correct I mean training's gotten better over the time it so really has they yeah. understand that more so you know you can do it in a way other than by saying I'm not you know I'll, nope I'm not talking to you I'm not giving you yeah. any information don't I get flip my them turn. off <laughs> yeah I <laughs> mean there's a, there's a way that you can do it and I think they they accept that easier Absolutely. today and yeah. they're not going to have you put your hand on, on a button no they're, just, not, they're not going to put your hand on the screen no more that's a great <laughs> scene from the wire they used a copy <laughs> machine yeah. I don't know if yeah. what we did yeah. on my the t- part of town that I worked on was we just had recorders in the back seat well we, of course we had those as well <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> But, you know, we're looking for these lessons, Stan. I think the, the probably the biggest lesson that I've taken away from here is in in practically every circumstance, mm. there's a decision that the defender could have made Yes. Yeah. that would have avoided the deadly confrontation, right? Whether it's don't open the door to see who's outside. Correct. Or whether it's Stay don't get the out car. of the car. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. Or yeah. Or... Or you know, call nine one one and wait in your room yeah. instead of going out into the living room. You know, and and uh, it's tough. Some of that goes against sort of like our our human nature, especially mm-hmm. a lot of us are are men. Let's face it, right? And we've got that sort of instinct, Protecting, the defensive yeah, instinct. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I've actually I've heard I've heard come across a couple of cases where if the if the people had just taken their wife's advice, like the whole thing's that's hilarious. But you're probably right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We just heard the, the Charles Dorsey case where the guy was at the wrong house and trying uh-huh. to get in. Yeah. You're right. You can hear on the recording the wife's like, Don't go outside. Don't go outside. Yeah. You know, that if he had gone outside, he may have been arrested <clears> and, and he waited for the guy to get in and then he shot him and he and he was justified. So so it's so that I you know, we just talked about the Andrew or uh, the Alexander Weiss case, and here's a guy who got in a car accident. The other guy's getting real aggressive towards him. He says, "I should call the cops." He says, "If you call the cops, I'm gonna kill you." So he goes back oh, to his God. car, which is still running, and he gets his cell phone and he gets his gun, and then goes back to talk to the guy. Right, and that's at any moment as a concealed carrier, you find yourself like, "Oh, I'm gonna get the gun now." Yeah. I mean, especially if you're not carrying it on you, but if you're a gun owner and you're like, oh, I'm going to go to my glove box and get the gun because I might need it. Yeah. Like, that's the <clears> alarm. <throat> if you yeah. have that thought, it's like, okay, yeah. what else can I do? Even if it doesn't make me feel good as a man, 
that would keep me from having to shoot this guy because <clears throat> we know already, even if you win that fight, even yeah. if you win the second fight, everyone's a loser. You know, yeah, those absolutely. are the biggest lessons that I've gotten from these cases. You said and something that, in that article that really stuck with me, uh, speaking about the Weiss case, and that is don't go back to the fight. So yeah, if, yeah. You, if you're able to get away <laughs> mm-hmm. and have a means of egress somewhere you can get away to, especially like in a road rage incident or something like that, it's different if somebody comes in your home. But, you know, if you have a means to just get out of that situation, do not go back to it. Yeah. You know, yeah. If you, if, yeah. Unless you got to go back for a family member <clears throat> or something like that. Or if you don't have to reason. go yeah. back, go get out. Well, and that's, How do you, how yeah. do you explain to a jury that your fear was reasonable? That you thought but you were you in went, immediate fear, yeah, but you go and, back and again. You went back to the danger. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely. Lie. Yeah. Well, when we were talking about so one thing, and Stan and I can both talk about this, but and we talk about you know, well, we're men, we're pro- kind of you know, fundamental, basic protectors, or we want to be, we want to solve something, we want to get involved, um, and people tend to with firearm get more involved. Um, but we've talked about police officers and I know some, I know plenty of police officers who I would go through any door with their badass officers. Right. And they do not get involved in stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've talked with Pat McNamara yeah. talking about, you know, and Larry Vickers, Vickers and these yeah. Delta force guys. The first thing they're going to do is get out of that situation. And police officer, we talked about lying earlier too. And yes, police officers can lie when they're interviewing to, to, uh, you know, um, suspects or whatever. <clears throat> but there are a lot of times when, <clears throat> I mean, I, I remember several instances where I would, you know, lie to somebody just to get them, you know, uh, patted down and in my back seat as fast as I could, because I know if I push this or if I let it go longer, this was going to be a fight. Yeah. Um, mm. PCP. I mean, oh my God. I remember coming up on guys <laughs> stripping down in the middle of the street going crazy. Yeah. And it was like, oh, man, I'm on my way to breakfast or my uh, dinner, man. I, 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 man, I don't got time for this. Can I just get your information right quick? And while we, you're saying that, you're patting them down real quick and putting them in your car. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, oh, okay, good. I got them in the car. Yeah. So that no fight. Now I can get somebody over here to help me because it's going to be a fight. Yeah. Once we have yeah. to handcuff this guy. And, and people think I, I think people who don't have that experience or you know maybe not know police officers. I mean, police officers deal with this stuff every day. Yes, that they're working. <clears throat> they can re and we've talked about this before too. Police officers have they don't have they don't have um, better intuition than other people, but they have better trusted intuition from mm-hmm. other people because they have more experience that's right using that intuition and and finding out yep that's right i was right if i would have done this that would have happened mm-hmm. and other people don't have that correct <clears throat> and so for somebody to think well i've got this firearm and i should get involved they really should i mean the mindset of a badass police officer mm-hmm. you know who initiates his own uh, own activity and kicks ass on the street take it they're they're when when they get into these certain situations, they're looking for the quickest way to end it. And we've talked about how many times could you have shot right. somebody yes. that you sure. didn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. people really should think about that, that, you know, and, and a lot of people think that they want to be like, um, you know, that they have a firearm now and they want to they want to think like that. But it's really kind of counteractive thinking the what real officers out on the street are because they're not they're trying to control that situation and once they get that control they lock that control down and they don't and they don't go back to a fight That's or they right. don't and, so it's and, just and, and to piggyback <clears throat> Mike's thought you know um, one of the things that police officers also do is you know we we learn from each other because mm-hmm. at the end of the night people are telling their stories oh yeah, yeah. and 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 we learn <clears throat> that you know. When you hear a story from another officer that's been through something that particular day, you go, okay, you know, if I would have done this. And sometimes he'll say, you know, I shouldn't have done this. You know, because mm-hmm. we had a lot of officers sometimes that would, and we would identify that, that pat somebody down, they find some drugs, and they put it on the, <laughs> oh, yeah. on, on the hood. Well, and then they continue to pat them down versus handcuffing them. Yeah. Every single time, bar none, there's going to be a chase 
or they're gonna try to you know eat, eat the, dope. the dope. Yeah, they'll yeah. eat the dope, and then there's a fight. Yeah. So a fight comes out of that, and then you learn. Okay, you find it, leave it where it is. You know yeah. what you it is. You don't even need to pull it. You out. You don't have to pull it out. R- handcuff them. Yep. And then pull right. Or sometimes, like Mike said, I mean, there's been a few cases because there's not too many that we run into in the field, but there are some that their motivation is to to cause harm to you. Mm-hmm. That you run into, and you know, although we're pretty tough guys, but it's like mm, I need to put this one up. I need to. So you talk them in, you sweet talk them into the talk, car. Yeah. Not that we're not down with fighting, but you really don't want to in certain cases pick when you know battles. somebody is. You got to pick your battles you because your it's battles. all about winning. So you're playing chess at the same time, and you're not allowing mm. your ego to outweigh your common sense. And that's what happens with concealed carriers at times. Is they they do that. It's like I got the gun now. So they have this inflated ego, and they're making bad decisions because it's like, you know, I can take your life, but do you want to? Yeah, and, you know, police officers are trained to handle those situations, right? And that's part of their job. We ask, this is why I'm, I'm usually super sympathetic, even when police officers make mistakes when it comes to these shootings, because we're asking them to put themselves in danger to, dis, you know, to resolve a scary incident, right? Mm-hmm. And, but but the average citizen does not have to do that. Mm-hmm. And so we talk about, you know, we talk about being a good witness. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of times where you could intervene with a gun, but you're taking on a huge amount of risk and opening up the door to a life and death situation when instead you get on the phone with 911. That's right. Mm-hmm. Be a good witness. That's the better way to help than to get involved yourself. And that's when we came up with the citizen's use of force continuum. Uh, continuum because... Mm-hmm. That is right. I mean, you, you have to avoid at all costs. And most most of the time, it is better to be have a better report than to get involved. Yeah. To be, to be a good witness <clears throat> instead of being an involved person. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, something about that, especially after you call, because there's two mistakes. You don't call 911 and you involve yourself. And then you do call 911 and you continue the pursuit instead of, especially back in the day in the 90s before we had all the camera phones and stuff. You have to kind of rely on your memory. Okay, did he wear a green shirt? Was it like mm-hmm. red shoes? Nowadays, you can take a picture of the person, blow it up. You got all the stuff you need. You've given them the stuff that they need. Stop trying to be the police. And that's a lot of, you know, like these current cases that we're dealing with right now, mm-hmm. the citizen cases, a lot of times they go too far. Stop trying to make citizens' arrests on stuff where people are taking property or in a nonviolent incident doesn't concern you and your family. If it's a violent incident, mm-hmm. you got to make the decision. But mm-hmm. if it's not a violent incident, stay your butt where you are. Give the people that are supposed to, like 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 uh, Sean said, that get paid to be in danger. That's their job. Let them do their job. Just because you have a gun, that doesn't make you a cop. And don't be that way. Yeah, man, that's a recipe for disaster. One thing that we talk about a lot is visualization mm-hmm. and thinking about. If you think about something and you visualize it, the situation, whatever, you're more likely if that situation arises not to be vapor locked and thinking, oh, what mm-hmm. I, this, this, I'm taking this all in. I've never thought about this before. What mm-hmm. do I do? And there's a couple of uh, firearms trainers that, that talk about this as well. And that is, you know, beforehand, th- actually sit and think w- what would be required for me to get involved? Mm-hmm. Like, <clears throat> yeah. What am I going to walk away from? And then, you know, what is that line to where I'm willing to risk my freedom and my life yeah. to step over that to get involved with potential deadly force? And that's going to be different for everyone. <clears throat> yeah. But as long as you think about the actual real ramifications of what can happen once you make mm-hmm. that decision to get engaged, I mean, you are putting your life and freedom on the line mm-hmm. when, when you step into that situation. So for me – and I've told my friends this, like, especially now during COVID with lots of new gun owners. Mm-hmm. I've got a couple of my friends. I tell them, I was like, look, you really have to think about this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's the, it's the realest thing in the world. Like, mm-hmm. the decision you make can impact you and your family's lives forever. So you better think about it. And like I said, it's different for everyone. But as long as they think about it, I think that's the first step. I agree. And I think with visual, visualization, and we do talk about that a lot, and I think it's hugely important. Mm-hmm. And with visualization, you have to be careful because um, I used to fall asleep going through houses, mm-hmm. raids in houses, because I was running warrants. We were, running entr- we were doing entries three, four, five times a week. Mm-hmm. 
um, when I was working in impact. And so I would fall asleep going through these and there's two things that happen and it's just human nature. Your mind will build your scenario more complex and more complex and more complex and it will make it unwinnable. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful of that. Mm -hmm. And there were times when I, I always thought of it as a, um, like a cassette tape. You play it and you don't do this anymore with, uh, you know, iTunes movies or even DVDs, but you rewind. And there would be times when I get to points in my mind where I would have to stop and I'd have to rewind back right. to not make it as complex. The second mm -hmm. thing is you always, always have to remember that every scenario that you present doesn't have to be met with force. Every scenario right. doesn't have to be met with a firearm. Every scenario doesn't have to be met with a interjection of yourself into this. Mm -hmm. So like Justin was saying, if you have a clear idea of what would cause me to do this and what wouldn't cause me to do that, mm -hmm. also think about mental imagery and visualization of what you would do in a situation if you weren't if you didn't have interject yourself into it. Yeah. What would you do in a situation? What would you get tag numbers? Yes. Would you get the car descriptions? Yes. Would you get try to get the best um physical descriptions of the person? Would you try to get video? Would you try to get photo? Because I know how hard it is to get photo and video. You know, you get your camera out. Oh, shit. You swipe up and, oh, dang, it, it's not working. I have to put my code in. So you have to think about these things. So that's actually a good point mm -hmm. to think about. Of mm -hmm. If it's not meeting this, that's what right. am I going to do? And, you know, just to piggyback Mike's thought, you know, a good tool that you can use is something that we already give you guys, and, and, and that is who, who, who doesn't have or members, that is, you know, um, the, the Citizens Use of Force Continuum. You know, you could use that tool and say, you know, okay, so tonight I'm going to go through a scenario with my you know, the bank that I go to all the time or whatever, the, mm -hmm. you know, the 7-Eleven I go to all the time, and in this particular one I'm going to, you know, really work through in my mind before I go to sleep, you know, how to de-escalate if I run into a situation. <coughs> and then you go to the next step. So, okay, the next tool is, okay, avoidance and, mm -hmm. you know, and then keep going on, you know. So avoidance, de-escalation, you know, the, um, it being escalated, you know, and, 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 and each time figure out a way for you to step out of that rally. situation. Yeah, to sidestep mm -hmm. it. Right to avoid it's like which which Mike has created this thing to do so, and then all the way build it all the way up to deadly force when you have to use force and like like Justin said you know start working on okay I'm by myself the next one now with my son the next one I'm with my wife the next one you know and just kind of keep working on that and practice these things and utilize the continu the, the continuum along with some of these articles that that Sean and Don write and then work through you don't have to keep making them up. Use the scenarios that they give you yeah. in the articles but, to work through the tools that we give you. Yeah. And that's so where it full. What's if that? I can bring it full circle, Stan, like it made me think of, remember that one member, they did it anonymously, but they sent in, they lived on that ranch in California. Yep. Yeah. And, and they, uh, late at night, this guy shirtless, shoeless, yes. bloody wearing blue jeans on his porch, demanding to be let in banging on the door, trying to use the, the porch swing as a ramrod, yes. pulling bushes out. And I remember he wrote in that email that he remembered the, the Ted Wafer story. Yep. That's right. About And the lesson was, <clears throat> don't open the door. Yes. Don't go outside. Yes. And so he got his wife in a safe place in the house with the kids. She mm -hmm. called 911. He was rural, so it took him like 20 minutes, 20 to, get minutes out there. to get there. Yeah. This guy was raging in his yard for 20 minutes, and he had a face-to-face -face encounter with him <clears> over the, a window. Yeah, I was going to say. Yep. And he said... If you break in, I'm going to shoot you. Mm -hmm. And in the end, the cops got there. They they brought him down. No one was shot. Th that that man didn't have to explain to his kids why he shot somebody on their porch that night. That's right. And and that vi he had in mind one of the articles that we had written. Yeah, and, and he had visualized that scenario, and it it may have affected the outcome. And that's what I got into. And it, it absolutely for. did. You know, because and mm -hmm. we get those often. You know, probably about once a week. You know, we'll have a an incident that someone will share with us about. You know, they, they de-escalated because they, they read your articles. And, and, and that's more, you know, you know, us having these discussions are really, really helpful. The podcasts are amazing. When you, you gather little nuggets, you don't have to believe or, you know, you know uh, attach everything that we say. But we give a lot of good nuggets and tips that you guys should take away with you and, and pick and choose. Cherry pick what you like out of these. But the same thing with the articles. Just utilize mm -hmm. these things, you know, because we've had these experiences and you have not. 
So you learn from the people that have had good experiences and bad experiences, and you you take the good out of all of these things and and polish your decision making is really what this is all about. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's a great point. <clears throat> so um, I think we're going on good time. We probably need to. You want to do key takeaways? Yeah. I uh, get a start. <laughs> you, you, how you get to start? Go ahead. My key takeaway is do not get it pulled over by Stan <laughs> <laughs> in the wrong neighborhood because you might have to put your palm up on the screen of his MDT. I'm going to lie to you. I'm going to lie to you. Say I got you. Do, do you have the little gel like the, like that they what they do ultrasound? You put it on their hand, smear it around, tell them to put it yeah, up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not. What's your real takeaway? You don't. Really, come on, stop, don't do that. Um. <clears throat> You know, my 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 takeaway is that what what he said at the very end, <laughs> what he said at the very end, these stories that they've been doing, that's why I say they're the meat and potatoes of what we do. Mm. These stories are perfect um, examples to put yourself into and kind of go through and, and, and understand what happened to these people and to... Um, just just be aware and read these stories and get on the newsletter list because even though these are happening to other people, <coughs> it you might find yourself in a similar situation mm-hmm. like the guy out in California. And that was an awesome email to get from that guy because I remember he had yeah. this face-to-face yeah. at the back of his house and he was inside and he said he was scared shitless. Yeah. And this oh, guy sure was looking, looking at him, yeah. you know, through the window like, I'm coming in. <laughs> and he was, you know, but but he kept his cool the whole time because of the Ted Wafer case. So yeah. that'd be my key takeaway. And yeah. not to get pulled out by Stan. <laughs> Shut up. And, and, and then mine, of course, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to stick to, and, and hopefully we can get Justin to uh, attach the uh, citizens use of force continuum. Yep. Utilize the tools that not only you know that we give, you know, people like Andrew Branca, uh, Don West, Sean Vincent. Utilize these these um, these takeaways and these tools to keep you from launching yourself into um, a, a a deadly force incident that you shouldn't be in. So that's my takeaway. Uh, mine is, uh, I think the articles that Sean and Don do together. Sean does more of them. Probably the most valuable content we put out mm-hmm. because you're able to to get the knowledge and experience of so many of these people that have went through this, and a lot of them have changed their lives. They may be in prison for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he's able to distill it down and also write it in a way to where, you know, you want to find out what mm-hmm. happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and and put all the facts in there and y- whenever you're able to learn from somebody else's mistakes yeah that's extremely valuable mm-hmm. and i don't yep. see anyone else out here doing the stuff like he's doing mm-hmm. so i tell everyone like I- if you're a concealed carrier and it is kind of a lifestyle like mm-hmm. if you're going to live your life with that as a part of it you know you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't read this stuff because it doesn't cost anything and you're getting a tremendous amount of knowledge about what really happens that's right. it's not opinions it's yeah. not i this is what i think will happen it happened yes like yeah. there's either someone in prison or not yes mm-hmm. so and you can see what put them there yes and so to me that's the biggest takeaway i just i i don't think you can overstate the value of the of yeah this that's stuff. right and sean you're up well that's nice i i, I really appreciate the feedback guys because it uh in, the longer i've done them the more i enjoy doing them and the uh, the more depth and nuance i can find in in these different scenarios so oh my takeaway would be i had a really good one a second ago but i forgot about it now (laughs) it's uh you you know what i've i've looked for in my personal life more and more things that i can do that would avoid confrontation you know and and it's like, like i'm more concerned about uh, potential invaders now that the economy's tanking and we're having, you know, I don't know what things would be like, all these people unemployed, mm-hmm. right? And so I, I made an investment in, uh, I enhanced my security system, I got more lights on my yard, I got more automation, I know how to use those tools more. You know, anything I can do to make my house less attractive, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You talk about the situational awareness to bring this full circle, you know, my situational awareness is higher and, um, yeah, I'm just becoming more alert, aware, 
person since I've been writing these articles for you guys. And, and that's, that's kept me out of trouble, I'm pretty sure. You know, one thing he said, I, I'm a quote guy, so I'm going to end this with this quote because this quote, I talk, talked to my daughter about this quote um, recently because it really hits home with this coronavirus, but also like going through divorce personally, but he, even with this type of stuff, crisis doesn't build character, it reveals it. Mm -hmm. mm. So be the person you are in crisis and be the person you want to be and need to be for your legal, physical, legal, and emotional, mental survival in one of these things. All right. Thanks, Sean. Right. You guys Thanks, be safe Sean. Out there. Great Good to have you on. Y'all guys be safe.